any of this pit maneuver stuff and J turns and high speed backing, if you're using any of those skills, you've done something probably really silly or just gotten into an, a hornet's nest of trouble all of a sudden. My name is Wyatt Knox and I'm the Special Projects Director here at the Team O'Neill Rally School. I've been instructing professionally high-speed driving, high-risk driving for over a decade now. So I started rallying when I was 18 or 19 years old and I do a few a year. 2012 I did the entire National US Championship and I won two-wheel drive. The definition of rally racing, getting from point A to point B quickly with the vehicle still running underneath you, is basically the definition of tactical driving. Tactical mobility in a nutshell is basically having excellent car control so that if something happens, you know you're capable of handling your vehicle and its occupants safely and also being able to respond to other potential happenings depending on what sort of a you might be involved in. For the most part, the folks that we put through these types of courses here at the Rally School are with the United States and friendly governments, venturing into special operations folks who spend a lot of time in some pretty rough places around the world. Disclaimer, a lot of the stuff that we're doing here on our private 600 acre facility hidden away in the mountains of New Hampshire is training folks for high-risk environments overseas. It's definitely not for the roads of America and that sort of thing. Tactical mobility, the way that we train it here, getting really, really good car control in all different kinds of vehicles, and then introducing some of the offensive and defensive skills that you might need. So this car is a Ford Crown Victoria. It makes a really excellent training platform for us because it's representative of so many heavy American rear wheel drive automatic vehicles that are commonly used by you know security professionals. A rear wheel drive car like this, when you accelerate, the rear tires spin and the back end of the car swings all over the place. So it's really good for training and getting into a bunch of skids and sliding around and learning how to handle that. We do weld on these big heavy duty steel bumpers so that we can run into each other without doing so much damage, but they've got good suspension and really thick wheels and tires and stuff from the factory. We have snow tires on this one. You can see it's met some of the other cars and then we just do the, uh, the big steel bumpers in the back. All right, so we're gonna set up a course out here, take this car out and run through some representative scenarios that you might find out in the real world. All right, coming back at you. So a J-turn is essentially just a reverse 180. You're gonna use a J-turn if you're driving along down the road and up ahead for whatever reason, you see something you don't like. You'd much rather be going the other direction quickly. J-turns, it's kind of a Hollywood move. You see it a ton in the action movies and TV shows and that kind of thing. It's not something that you know, a lot of people are really gonna use operationally overseas, especially if you're in, you know, an armored SUV. Are you gonna do a J-turn? No, it's gonna flip over. If you're in a congested urban area, are you gonna do a J-turn? No, you're gonna run into something. But if you've got enough area and you've deemed, hey, we need to be going backwards at high speed right now, the more tools you have in the toolbox, the better off you're gonna be. Come to a full and complete stop, get it into reverse, back up. We usually give it the count of three, so one, two, three, let off the throttle and turn. Add a little bit of brake and you can get the car to snap around nice and quick. While it's rotating, engage drive, straighten the wheel and get out of there. The pit maneuver is basically a pursuit technique when you need the vehicle that is in front of you to either get out of your way or come to a stop. It's necessary to do that by doing as little harm to your own vehicle as possible. Here comes, looks like they might try a pit here, getting up on the right hand side, he'll get up there. There it is, there's the pit maneuver coming to a stop. In order for the police to use it, it's considered use of deadly force here in America. So unless whatever that person has done warrants that, you're not gonna see that, but you will see it you know, very commonly overseas. You can do a pit maneuver on either side of the vehicle. The reason that most folks in the United States, you know, the police departments used to train, match your left front to their right rear, is because it's easier for the driver and you're spinning them away away from oncoming traffic for you know, police department use. Say this is your target vehicle for a pit maneuver, kind of the sweet spot that you're going for is right in this area right here. If you're too far to the back, chances are you'll just damage the car without actually spinning it out enough. And if you get up into the wheel and that sort of thing, you're gonna do a lot of damage to your own vehicle and it might not work out so well. 
You're following a vehicle, lagging behind. When you decide it's time, drive up quickly, match your left front with their right rear, make contact, turn in and accelerate. And if you do it just right and drive through them, that car's gonna spin out. And even for an expert, it's not gonna be recoverable and they'll be spun around and stopped. A much more useful skill than being super good at J-turns is actually just being able to back up at high speed. If you're in an urban environment and you need to back around, you know, back through traffic and park vehicles, you're not gonna be doing J-turns. When you're backing up, a lot of the engineering that's gone into making your car perform the way that it does is working against you. Whenever you're in reverse, your car's rear steering. If your car is rear wheel drive, now it's front wheel drive. Even the way that the brakes work and everything else, cars are not designed to drive quickly backwards and most drivers are just not great at it. The easiest sneaky trick is to get your left arm over the seat belt, brace your left foot kind of over where the dead pedal might be and turn yourself around in the seat, you know, as much as possible. And my hand is at what would be 12 o'clock if the wheel were straight. I'm not very good at high speed backing. I would need one more attempt. It's terrible in the ice. You've got to be good with your mirrors. So hopefully you've got them adjusted and you've got a little bit of wherewithal. And it's not that tricky. It's nice. You've got both hands on the wheel, watching your left side and your right side and backing through, you know, traffic or around some obstacles. And the best thing you can do is get backed into a side street or an alleyway or something like that. Get it into drive so you can really get some speed up and get out of there. If you're ever the passenger in a vehicle and for whatever reason the driver becomes incapacitated to the point where they're no longer able to operate that vehicle anymore, somebody's diabetic or if they're prone to seizures or anything like that, that's where hopefully you've practiced the driver down drill. You're in the passenger seat, something happens and you realize that the driver is no longer able to operate the vehicle appropriately. First step is get your belt off and reach across to grab the handle on the door. Not the handle that opens it, but like the safety handle. And that'll just help kind of hold them in position while you scoot over, basically sweep their legs out of the way and you're gonna be operating the pedals with your left foot only and the steering wheel with your right hand only. The way that we train it, is yeah, you've actually got to get through some exercises like that so that you're pretty capable and you can make it around a few turns and then get the vehicle to a stop. I feel much better oh, now. Oh yeah, no, yeah, I'm here, yep, no problem, yep. Some of the folks that are headed overseas to pretty hostile environments will train the same drill, but with, you know, three men in the car, four men in the car, the driver down drill at that point turns into passenger takes control, rear seat gets the driver out, do what you can for them. Passenger moves completely into the driver's seat. Car continues driving. Most drivers out there on the street are probably just okay driving around with perfectly normal kind of unaltered vehicles. But it's good to be able to do some of these things and to go through this training and have those skills and know how to prepare vehicles so that if for some reason you do need to just drive at the limit or get through some different situations, you've got those skills. Personally, when I'm looking for a vehicle, I either select an older vehicle that doesn't have ABS and traction control and that sort of thing, or at least an older vehicle, it's usually easy to disable. You know, in this 2002 or three Subaru, I can pull a fuse or two, and in about 30 seconds, we're analog, no electronics, ready to go, have a good time, slide around corners. Basically, driving with ABS and traction control is like swimming with a life jacket on. You know, it's really easy to swim and you can swim around just fine, but ABS and traction control limit your car's performance a dramatic amount on a slippery road. You can't really stop that well. You can't get uphill sometimes, it can be frustrating. But ABS and traction control and also stability control, they're all wonderful systems and they've definitely saved lives. So the first time you approach an unfamiliar vehicle, there's kind of a little checklist that you can do. Even if you just have a second to look at one side or do a quick walk around, number one's always gonna be tires. What kind of condition are they in? Do they have air in them or do they have tread? So a winter tire is much softer rubber, like a pencil eraser almost. You can hit it with your thumb and kind of squish it around. And that's what you're looking for in very cold temperatures 
to stay stuck to the road. Just gauging the tire pressure, usually you can give it just the thumb test is just pushing in on the middle of the sidewall and you should get, you know, a quarter inch of deflection or so. Too hard's not really a problem. If it's too soft, it'll overheat and you'll have a blowout. If a car like this might be strange to you, get yourself in, get your seat and your steering wheel properly adjusted and adjust your mirrors. It's really the silly stuff that ends up biting people. The mirrors haven't been adjusted or you don't know where the wipers are and you hit a big mud puddle and then you're turning the headlights on and whacking the stereo and trying to figure it all out. But it really only takes 30 seconds to a minute of sitting in a car to make yourself kind of happy with it and you're good to go. So what we've got here is a Subaru WRX. It's an all wheel drive turbocharged car. We don't have any ABS or traction control active on this. It's fully analog. We're gonna take this car, put it through its paces and a few exercises out here at the rally school. All right, just roll my windows up. It's gonna get a little slushy. Most of the skills that we're teaching here at the rally school are rally-based skills. The Scandinavians came up with left foot braking for the most part, using left foot braking in front wheel drive cars to get around corners faster, doing the pendulum turns, you know, it's called the Scandinavian flick by most people, intentionally chucking the car sideways to get around corners. They were really the early masters of this kind of car control and it's developed since then um, as cars have gotten a little better and tires and suspensions have gotten a little better, there's more kinds of racing that have used left foot braking. Now, basically everybody's doing it. You know, there's a lot of different reasons for left foot braking. The first one is always just gonna be reaction time. Being able to get to the brake very quickly uh, lets you drive a lot faster, a lot more safely. One of the other main reasons for left foot braking is to be able to control the weight of the car. Part of what you're doing is putting weight on the front to help the car turn. And if the back end slides around because of that, you need to put weight on the back for stability. And that's what you're doing with your right foot on the throttle and your left foot on the brake is just transferring weight smoothly to the front and smoothly to the rear. There's a common misconception in the world right now that a skidding car is out of control because if you skid, you'll crash. And the truth is there's a huge amount of gray area there where you're skidding around and you're sliding a car, but you're well under control. And that's really where you're getting the most performance out of you know, any vehicle. If you watch a dirt bike, they're always spinning tires and locking tires up and sliding around corners. It's the same with cars. It's just people have forgotten how to do it. Most people were never taught how to do it. And now most cars come with systems that don't even allow you to do it. One really important skill to have if you're traveling to these high risk environments is to be able to move other objects and or vehicles out of your way as necessary. Going hot. If you need to breach a barricade with a vehicle or get through some kind of roadblock, the most important thing is knowing where the strong points on your car are. And those are gonna be your two frame rails in the front. Sometimes they're closer together, or further apart, or higher up or lower down. And you're gonna to wanna to line those up directly with whatever it is you're trying to move out of the way. With a vehicle blocking the road, you're gonna line up one of your frame rails with the rear wheel of the vehicle that you're trying to move. If you happen to see that it's a pickup truck that's freighted down in the back, sure, go for the front. Whichever end looks lighter, usually it's the back, that's where you're gonna wanna square up with and push out of the way. And if you can manage to hit that rear wheel with your frame rail, you're just gonna break that contact patch with the ground of those rear wheels and push that car out of your way very easily without doing really any damage to your own car. Be aware, in a normal car, your airbags are gonna go off, the fuel pump might shut off, and you're now gonna be stranded right in the worst possible situation just having done something really stupid. Most vehicles that are kind of fleet supplied to the folks that we work with that are going overseas, that stuff's all deactivated. Really the baseline of all of the training that we do here is car control. And that comes from just spending hours, sliding cars around, and learning where the road's limits and your own limits and different vehicles' limits all exist. And it just gives you a tremendous amount of capabilities to get in and outperform 90-something percent of normal drivers that might be out there on the road. Making decisions based on what you're presented with is one way to exercise your mind and learn how to pay attention to the small things. 
I was a special agent uh, with the FBI. My job was to catch spies. Retired Navy SEAL, 21 years combat experience, and now a crisis management professional. I've been instructing professionally high-speed driving with the United States and friendly government. If you take the time to evaluate walking or driving that same route every day, you've just reduced the number of things you have to pay attention to when something bad occurs.